All right, it's noon, so I think we'll get started, if everyone wants to sit. Um, to, on behalf of the First Fridays Committee and the Ask Department, welcome to First Fridays. I'm Caitlin Marino. Uh, welcome back to our regular guests, and of course, a special welcome to any who are with us for the first time, and it's nice to see that everyone's thought out a bit. First Fridays is a monthly series of presentations made possible by a generous gift from Governor Elmer L. Anderson and Mrs. Eleanor Anderson in honor of former library director, Dr. Edward B. Stanford. The presentations are based on materials in the university libraries, archives, and special collections. This year's theme is We Are Here, Women in the Archives, focusing on female identifying stories. Today's presen presentation focus on the James Ford Bell Library um, please note, if you had looked at one of our earlier flyers, the Northwest Architectural Archives presentation, which was originally planned to follow the Bell Library presentation, has been canceled. We apologize, um, but Marguerite Ragnow will be speaking for the entire hour. And then lunch today is from Gorka Palace. Um, tour afterwards will be with Tim Johnson. He's waving in the back, if you don't know. Um, so if you would like to have a tour of our cavern after the show, um, just go find him. And then before we move on to the rest of the presentation, um, I think we have a short announcement from Kristen Clark about Friends of the Libraries. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to see you on a warmer day <laughs> from this week. Anyway, who knew this was the heat wave day? Um, uh, my name is Kirsten Clark and I work here in the libraries but I'm also on the board for the Friends of the Library and I just wanted to uh, also thank you all for coming and let you know we have a little bit of information on the back table about some of our friends groups. Um, one in particular, we do have a friends group um, that is the associates of the James Ford Bell Library. So with Maggie talking about it, you're going to see a lot of the, the resources that they have in that collection and that's a great way to support it. We have other friends groups. Um, there are friends groups for the Treader Collection, the Curlin Friends, the Friends of the Anderson Horticultural Library, the Friends of the Sherlock Holmes Collection, and then our larger Friends of the Libraries group that supports many other initiatives and other collections within the library. So again, welcome and thank you for coming. So our presentation today is Both Seen and Unseen, Early Modern Women in Global Perspectives by Dr. Marguerite Ragnow. Women filled the pages of early modern travel narratives, many authored by men, but a few written by women, yet somehow we seem to know very little about these women. Most of them remain unseen by history. Join curator Marguerite Ragnow as she explores how European men depicted the women they encountered on their travels, and here's some of the female travelers' perspectives of the people they met on their journeys. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank all of you for coming this afternoon. Um, I seem to have three microphone choices, so I'm going to get rid of two of them. <clears throat> and get the first slide up there. So as Caitlin mentioned, um, this year's theme uh, is Women in the Archives. And while almost no one has studied them, the James Ford Bell Library is just full of women. So many, in fact, that when I made this bold statement, um, and I don't know if I can get the mouse up here. Well, okay, so if you look at the second line, it says, as authors of their own stories, and that all of the women authors in the Bell Collection are travelers. Well, I forgot entirely that we have other women in the collection. Um, other female letter writers who staying at home corresponded with their traveling friends and relatives and thus their letters to these gentlemen can also be found in the collection. So almost all of the female authors in the collection were travelers. As noted on the slide, the women in the collection appear as authors of their own stories or as represented by men from their own cultures or from other cultures. Generally, it is European men writing about the women they encounter on their travels. Today, I'm first going to introduce you to three female travelers who recorded their thoughts and impressions, two published and one not. I'm also going to share the story of a woman who told her own very unique story, a traveler, but so much more. I will offer a few images that accompany two travel narratives written by men, and last but not least, female pirates. So let's get started. 
1750, on a warm afternoon on the 2nd of June, a young British Marine named James Gray stunned the crowd in a London tavern by announcing, why, gentlemen, James Gray will cast off his skin like a snake and become a new creature. In a word, gentlemen, I am as much a woman as my mother ever was, and my real name is Hannah Snell. Apparently, the crowd was stunned to silence. From that moment on, Hannah Snell became Britain's most famous female soldier and an overnight sensation. For the remainder of the year, she enthralled London theater audiences with tales of her life as a man soldiering for Britain. <coughs> Hannah was born in Worcester, England on 23 April 1723, uh, the daughter of William Snell, a hosier and dryer, and his wife Mary. Little is known of her childhood, although after her story became public, locals claimed that she'd played at soldiers when she was a child. Her parents both died when she was 17. And in 1740, she moved to London and married a Dutch seaman named James Soames. However, once she became pregnant with their daughter, her husband left her. The daughter was named Susanna, but she lived only a year. And after her daughter's death, Hannah decided that she was going to track down her husband one assumes because she loved him, but it doesn't say. <laughs> so she borrowed a suit of men's clothes from her brother-in-law, James Gray. She assumed his name and began to search for her husband. Traveling first to Coventry, she found herself impressed into the 6th Regiment of Foot in the Army of the Duke of Cumberland on 23 November 1745. And she went off to fight against the Stuart claimant or pretender to the British throne, popularly known as Bonnie Prince Charlie. So for those of you who don't know what impressment is, um, during this period, during times of war, the British government would send scouts out into the countryside and into the towns and pretty much grab any able-bodied boy or man for service in the armed forces, either in the army or on board ship, whether they had any experience or not. They got, they got on the job training. Um, so she was taken for a boy and impressed into the service and off she went. However, for preventing the rape of a local girl by her fellow soldiers, Hannah was sentenced to the lash by her sergeant. Now, all of the accounts say that she received 500 lashes. But I find that difficult to believe. Even 50 seems more than the boy she was believed to be would have been given. So I suspect that somebody made a typo, and that typo was continued on and on in all of the accounts that were uh, published subsequently. In any event, although she managed to conceal her identity and her sex during that ordeal, she deserted the army, traveled to Portsmouth, and instead joined the British Royal Marines. Her unit sailed to Lisbon aboard the ship Swallow. It was there that she learned her husband had been executed sometime previously for murder. In 1747, the Marines sailed to India, and in August of 1748, Hannah and her Marines were sent on an expedition to capture the colony at Pondicherry from the French, uh, actually from the French East India Company. There she su uh, sustained significant injuries to her legs and a musket ball to her groin. Um, reports indicate that she either removed the musket ball by herself or asked a local woman uh, to take it out in order to avoid being operated on by uh, the regimental surgeon and thus revealed as a woman. As a result, Hannah was promoted to ordinary seaman and served on two more ships before her unit was recalled to England. And once back in London, her tour of duty ended and she revealed her identity. So popular was she with her fellow Marines that even after her true identity was revealed, they encouraged her to apply to the Duke of Cumberland, who was the head of the army, for a military pension. She was successful, and her name was put on the military pension list. And later, in 1750, her military service was recognized. She received an honorable discharge and awarded a pension. Let's see. From the moment Hannah's secret was revealed, Writers and playwrights penned their own versions of Hannah's story. 
During her short stint on the stage, she wore her Marine uniform and did parade drills and sang military and other songs. She, she finally sold her story to a somewhat disreputable London publisher and two sold out editions of her biography titled The Female Soldier was, were published the same year. And in the Bell Collection we have a Dutch edition of this particular uh, text. Her portrait on sale on every corner, Hannah retired to Wapping and opened a pub, naming it The Female Warrior. The pub sign represented her in regimental dress on one side and in her marine uniform on the other with the inscription, The Widow in Masquerade. She married twice more and had two sons. But at the age of 68, she began showing signs of what we would call today dementia. And she was committed to Bethlehem Hospital in August of 1791, where she died the following February, 1792. At the time and since, there has been a lot of speculation as to just how much of her story was true and how much an exaggeration by her publisher in order to sell copies of the text. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Now we turn to two more sedate but no less adventurous ladies, Salome Danforth and Jemima Kindersley. We are fortunate to have Salome's journal documenting her trip from Boston to Smyrna on the Anatolian coast of the Aegean Sea in 1836. Salome was born into a distinguished family in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, which is the largest town in Berkshire County. Both her father, Colonel Joshua Danforth, and her grandfather, also Colonel Joshua Danforth, served in the Revolutionary Army. After the war, her father became postmaster of Pittsfield and went on to serve many other public offices, including as circuit court judge. In the 1830s, the Protestant ladies of Pittsfield collected funds to help establish a mission school in Smyrna under the direction of American missionary Jonathan Brewer. Why Smyrna? I don't know. Um, it was a very important commercial outpost um, the coast of the Aegean Sea, but it was, even though it was a Greek town, it was entirely controlled by the Ottoman Empire during this period. Salome's journal details her voyage to become a part of this enterprise, a daring adventure for a young middle-class American woman. Although her journal doesn't provide the year of her travels, we also have a letter in the collection that she wrote to her father from Smyrna, dated the 12th of May, 1837, which suggests that she came out from America the previous year in 1836. We do know that from the manuscript she left, that she left Boston on the 9th of June and arrived in Smyrna on the 2nd of August. The journal itself is rather chatty, and suggests that Salome had a lively mind and an insatiable curiosity. She vividly describes shipboard life, but also includes commentary on natural history and the weather, the other ships they encountered, and indeed all aspects of the voyage. Her ship, the Swallow, was a cargo ship, captained by a Mr. Wilson, um, and it had a few passengers. I shall read you a brief passage that I think provides a real sense of her style um, and character. July 1, Sunday, 22 days without catching a glimpse of terra firma, 3,150 miles from Boston. The sea is the heaviest yet experienced, and more than one of us has been the victim of a ducking. Every ship that passes us heaves and rolls precisely like one of those miniature craft in certain clocks that represent a storm at sea. The resemblance is perfect and without exaggeration. That's the only way I can convey to you the idea of the motion. The ladies are the only seasick persons. Still, none sit at the dinner table, though they hover variously on sofas, stools, and trunks, waiting for the spirit to move their troubled meals. The motion of the ship is too violent to admit to religious exercise. Indeed, it would be impossible even to read. In the afternoon, the captain takes a sight with his quadrant, obtains his longitude, and declares most positively that land will be visible before evening should the breeze hold out. At 4 p.m., I like to be particular, she says in parentheses, the aromatic perfumes of the yet unseen land scented the air. Some fancied the aroma of orange and lemon blossoms could be perceived. 
Unfortunately for that theory, they ceased budding months ago. At 5 p.m., the cry, land ho, sends a thrill throughout every breast. The gentlemen mounting the rigging, the ladies are impatient to have a look through the spyglass. The chickens and hens also display unusual impatience to see land. And here you see a little drawing that she did in the middle of the page. Uh, it shows the chickens and hens poking their heads out of their cage. I could find very little research available on Salome's life once she reached Smyrna. However, references to her appear in other people's letters and journals, and the record of the Berkshire Jubilee, held in Pittsfield, her hometown, on 22 and 23 August 1844, records that she was the head of a, quote, flourishing Protestant boarding school for girls in the village of Bornabut, about six miles from Smyrna, the only school of its kind in the Turkish Empire. She also married. Volume 80 of the Missionary Herald, dated 1884, reports on August 5th of that year, Mrs. Salome Danforth Stevens, for many years engaged as a teacher and in the evangelical work in Smyrna, died there. She had been a teacher and missionary in Turkey for 48 years. Our next intrepid traveler is Mrs. Jemima Kindersley. Her 300-page journal was published at London in 1777 as letters from the island of Tenerife, Brazil, the Cape of Good Hope, and the East Indies. These letters are dated June 1764 to February 1769 when she returned to England. Jemima was born in Norwich, England in 1741. At the age of 22, she married Colonel Nathaniel Kindersley, a soldier with the British East India Company's Bengal artillery. A year later, she gave birth to a son named Nathaniel Edward. And in June of the next year, 1764, she and her new son set sail for the East India Company station at Pondicherry, India, her husband having left earlier with his unit. She and her son arrived in June of 1765. And her account is of this long voyage, which included five months stay at the Cape of Good Hope, it also includes some visits to towns in the interior of India with her husband and then the voyage back to England in 1769. This traveling is captured in 68 letters. In this slide, you can see the route of her travels. Um, Oh, let's try again, sorry. Okay, there we go. Whoops. Okay, I'm gonna do what I tell my students never to do. I'm gonna actually point at the screen. <laughs> so she starts in England and then comes down and stays at Santa Cruz in the Isle of Tenerife. Then they travel to St. Salvador in Brazil, and then down to the Cape of Good Hope, where she stays for five months, and then on up to Pondicherry. And then the other sites are the travels in India that she records. And then she comes back the same route, Cape of Good Hope, and then stops at St. Helena, and then straight on back to England. <clears throat> Jemima Kindersley was one of the first women of Britain to publish a travel narrative of her own experiences. Her letters offer descriptive accounts of local history, regional cultural practices, and societal customs of the places she visited. And I'll read you a bit from her third letter, written from Santa Cruz in June of 1764, so you can get a bit of the flavor of her writing. Since my last letter, I have made a little excursion, which was pleasing on account of its novelty, both as to the objects which presented themselves and my manner of performing it than which nothing can be more ridiculous. Fancy that you see me meekly riding upon an ass, which is the way all of the ladies are obliged to travel here, on account of the commotions in the earth which have happened formerly and have thrown up such prodigious heaps of large stones in some places and, suck the and sunk the ground so deep in others that it is impossible for a carriage to move and extremely dangerous to venture on horseback. 
Therefore, all the ladies ride asses and all the gentlemen ride mules. Our journey was to Laguna, usually called the city, which is a pretty large town and regularly built, but quite unornamented and silent as the night. Many of the principal people at Santa Cruz have houses there, which they go to by way of retirement from business. It's about five miles from the sea. The road to it, if it can be called a road, is all the way uphill, in some parts steep, craggy, encumbered with pieces of loose rock, and most of the barren appearance, notwithstanding which one sees here and there scattered vineyards, which thrive amongst the stones. As soon as we arrived at the city, we found ourselves in another climate. Instead of the heat, which at Santa Cruz is very great, it is there so cool that we walked in the sun at midday with pleasure, and the air was fresh and perfectly agreeable. Laguna stands on an eminence, and Santa Cruz in a valley. But after allowing for the circumstances and the accidental difference of soil, etc., the change appears to me to be greater than with all those allowances one could possibly suppose within the distance of five miles. Jemima returned to England in 1769. <clears throat> her only stop, as you can see on the map, was at the island of St. Helena. Uh, and her wrote, she wrote her final letter there, February 1769. And one of the things she told about St. Helena, on account of the scarcity of fodder, it's apparently a fairly barren island, there are but few cattle kept, and those that are are so far at the disposal of the governor that no person can kill one of his own beasts without the governor's order, nor when it is killed, dispose of it, but according to his direction, which is to procure every family on the island a proper quantity. All kinds of provision, indeed, are obliged to be managed with economy in order to prevent scarcity. Whenever any English ship arrives, the island is obliged to provide the captain with at least one bullock for fresh provision, but they often take a greater quantity of salt meat than they give fresh. St. Helena was a British East India Company stronghold. It was the only stopping place for the company in this area for the long trip back to England. So it played a very important role for the British East India Company, and it was the logical place for Jemima to stop, considering she was traveling on British East India Company ships. Jemima's husband didn't accompany her back to England. He stayed behind and unfortunately died a few months later. She never remarried, but went on to engage in intellectual pursuits. At the age of 39, she published the translation of a series of essays by French philosopher Antoine Leonard Thomas, as well as two of her own original essays. She died quietly at home in the resort town of Bath in 1809. Our next woman of letters is Lady Elizabeth Craven, the third child of the fourth Earl of Berkeley. Elizabeth lived a privileged life, at least until the age of 16, when her father married her off to a man 12 years her senior, <coughs> William Craven, heir to the sixth Baron Craven. And the slides got a little out of order, so I'm going to move them up a little bit. <coughs> William was a known ladies' man and had numerous affairs, in addition to keeping Elizabeth pregnant for almost continuously for the first five years of their marriage. And let's see here. Finally, at the age of 23, <clears throat> Baroness Craven, as she was now because her husband had inherited the title, and finding herself for the first time not pregnant, this young mother of four decided to get back at her husband and have an affair. Now, this was not uncommon among people of this social class with their arranged marriages. However, discretion was the key, particularly for women. So Elizabeth did not have an affair with the second son of some country count or uh, earl, no. She had an affair with the Duke de Guinness, the French ambassador to England. This seriously damaged her reputation to the point where there was even an article about it in one of the London papers. Although she had three more children, from that point on she also led a somewhat reckless life. One scholar has described her as a total party girl. 
having numerous affairs and destroying her reputation in the bargain. Um, now, during this period, despite all the partying and the additional childbirth, Elizabeth became friends with uh, Horace Walpole, corresponding with him and visiting his home at Strawberry Hill. And some of her early work was published by the Strawberry Hill Press. Uh, Elizabeth was a dis an accomplished author <clears throat> during this period. She wrote satires, several plays, um, including something called the Miniature Picture, which was put on in Drury Lane in 1780 to uh, 1781. But finally, in 1783, after seven children, she and her husband separated. Although, now let's see if I can find this. There we go, all right. Although scholars believe it was a mutual decision and that he provided her with an annual allowance of 1,500 pounds a year, this was the final blow for English society. Finding her social situation intolerable, Elizabeth took her four-year-old son, Keppel, and moved to the continent. She lived first near the Palace of Versailles, where she wrote plays for the court theater, and then traveled from one major city to another, France, Italy, Austria, Poland, Bulgaria, Russia, Greece, and Turkey. Although she initially maintained a somewhat wild lifestyle, she began a correspondence with a man she'd met and gotten to know in France, Christian Frederick Charles Alexander, the Margrave of Brandenburg, Anspach, and Beirut, whose grandfather was the King of Prussia and who had a sickly wife at home. Needless to say, like all great stories, they fell in love, Elizabeth probably for the first time in her life. She wrote an account of all of her travels around Europe and into uh, Istanbul in the form of letters to the, to the Margrave, and at the suggestion of Walpole, published that as a journey through the Crimea to Constantinople, and it is this that's in the Bell Library collection. What makes Elizabeth unique among travel writers of this period, particularly women, is her frankness. Uh, for example, okay. There we go. Writing from Warsaw in 1786, quote, the Polish ladies seem to have much taste, magnificence, and gaiety. They are polite and lively, excessively accomplished, partial to the English. There is a princess de, de Radiswil, who if I were a man, I would certainly be devoted to. It's not the kind of thing you often find in travel literature written by women. And that is probably a relative of Jackie Onassis, whose maiden name was Radiswil. I could be very happy here, sir, if my heart could forget maternal duties, and she adds coyly, or those of friendship. And later, from St. Petersburg, the road between Warsaw and this place is one insipid flat, except just in and about the town of Nerva. I can conceive nothing so ennuyant or boring as traveling in such a country as this, one flat plain, the view terminated by a forest which you drive through only to arrive at the same scene you have quitted. The frost not hard enough to make the road good. This is not a sugar-coated narrative dressed for a middle-class audience. And she admits that she is not the most complacent of travelers. Mine, at present, is a geographical intercourse with the world, and I like to find the road I travel smooth. Wit and talents will always be objects of importance to me. I have found them here and shall be sorry to quit them. And you can see why. Describing her journey to Constantinople in April of 1786, on the seventh day, the Greek pilot, the only person on board who had ever been to Constantinople, was dead drunk and incapable of speaking, much less steering the ship. I, luckily, had a map of the Black Sea and the entrance to the canal, which alone was our guide. <laughs> she goes on to describe herself with the med on board deck and um, on the top deck, and she's sort of standing below on the poop deck with a travel case in one hand and the map and her umbrella in the other hand, being very concerned because she had written about this rock that separates um, 
the Black Sea from the Strait that enters into Constantinople, um, where hundreds of Turkish ships have foundered and been lost. And she's afraid that since nobody knows where the heck they are, um, they're going to hit this rock. And lo and behold, they come pretty near to it, but they miss it. Um, but her description of herself doing it and the fact that she's sort of the heroine of the hour um, is pretty typical of the tone of the entire volume. This is definitely her story. Um, she was also an accomplished musician and composer, as well as a playwright and an essayist, so not only a party girl. And she doesn't react favorably to much of the music that she hears on her travels. And I pulled out an example of her description of listening to some Greeks play um, at Istanbul. Let's see. Oh, I forgot this one. Um, so as you can see here, with respect to coffee, which you may think would be good in Turkey, I assure you, prepared by the Turks, it is the nastiest of beverages. Um, this is just a typical sample of her travel narrative. Um, she was grumpy. She was particular. She complained a lot. Um, she must have been really a joy to travel with. <laughs> um, but because of that, you get more of a sense that what you're reading about is actually what she saw, and it hasn't been doctored up for publication. Um, there's no guarantee that that's not the case, but compared to other travel narratives, it seems more real. So to the Greek musicians. In their parties upon the water, they generally have a lyre, a fiddle, and a guitar or two in the boats. With these instruments, they make a horrid noise. Each performer playing in a different key, and if they sing, all in discordant tones. This puzzles all my ideas concerning harmony, because nature has fixed the rules of it so well that any person possessing a good ear for music will compose in all the perfection of harmony without knowing the rules of competition, composition or even a note of music. Why then do not these Greeks find out they make nothing but discordant sounds when they sing or play? I confess it seems to me a very strange thing. Once back in Europe, in 1787, Elizabeth reunited with Christian Alexander, the Margrave, and when their spouse, spouses both died in 1791, they wasted no time getting married. The couple lived both in England and on the continent, and while Elizabeth never fully recovered her reputation, she did conv convince Francis II, the Holy Roman Emperor, to award her the title of Princess Berkeley. Berkeley had been her maiden name. But this was a title the English didn't recognize, and she wasn't accepted at court. Because, the king said, the Margrave was higher status than she was. Nevertheless, the couple lived a full life until Christian died suddenly in 1806. In 1821, Elizabeth moved permanently to Naples, Italy, where she had a home, and where she wrote a colorful memoir which was published in 1826. And we don't have it, but I really want to add it to the collection. She died two years later in 1828. What a life she led. When I began this presentation, I mentioned that the other source of women in the Bell collection was the travel narratives and books by men. And for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to focus on them. Nicolas de Nicolet was a French mathematician and geographer and sometimes spy. After a successful military career on his return to France, King Henry II of France made him geographer, ordinaire, and valet to the chamber. In 1551, Henry ordered him to follow Gabriel Daramon, envoy and ambassador to the Grand Turk, Suleiman the Magnificent. In the course of the voyage, his unofficial mission was to survey the places visited, including Istanbul in effect, spying for the French crown. His narrative was published first um, in Lyon in 1567. 
The Bell Library has eight editions of this text, ranging from 1568, um, beginning with the first edition, second issue, and continuing to 1585. The images that I'll be showing you come from an Italian edition published at Venice in 1580. And that's the title of that. What makes his travel narrative unique is the drawings. He documented people from all walks of life in nearly all the places he traveled, from nobles to merchants to slaves, including the women. These are somewhat static drawings focused more on costume than on personality. Nevertheless, they give us a priceless insight into a little bit of their lives. For example, <clears throat> here are images of women from the North African whoop, town of Algiers. <laughs> On the left is a Morisco woman of some standing, covered in what he describes as essentially a large blanket. Generally, Moriscos were Muslims who converted to Christianity, in Europe often under duress. And since Algiers was an Islamic town, being a Christian convert no doubt lowered their status. On the right, you see a young Morisco slave girl. In his account, Nicolet describes these girls as being dressed only in a garment of finely wrought chains, crocheted together into a sort of garment. In this particular edition, someone has hand-drawn that garment using gold ink. It doesn't exist in any of the other editions. Occasionally, after this one was, was done, I think there's one edition where someone um, did it on the plate, so she's kind of clothed. Um, but this one, when you look at it close, it's all hand done in gold. Next, we see a matron and a young maid from the Greek island of Chios. And these are just a few examples of the many illustrations found in, in his book. When Nicola got to Istanbul, he ran into a problem. The women of the court were locked in a harem. According to his account, this harem had no towers and only two gates, one of which was kept locked and the other kept open but guarded by eunuchs. Within the courtyard were the numerous small houses separated with chambers, kitchens, and other necessary buildings where the wives and concubines of the sultan lived. Nicholas says they numbered more than 200 and were, for the most part, daughters of Christians. Some bought from merchants and then offered to the sultan. Every 10 women had a matron who kept them in line and taught them various forms of needlework. There were more than 40 eunuch guards. Should any of the concubines become pregnant, she was separated from the others, endowed with estates and a pension, and numbered among his wives, so that her child, if it was a boy, could inherit the throne if necessary. Any concubines that didn't become pregnant after an unspecified period of time, the sultan married to officers of his court. So the bottom line is Nicholas couldn't draw them. However, he befriended one of the eunuchs, a fellow from Ragusa whom he wrote, quote, being a man of great discretion and a lover of virtue, end quote, obtained two different complete outfits and hired two public women, prostitutes, who posed for Nicholas. And here they are. This is one of the other things that makes his travel narrative so unique and valuable. He depicted people that almost no one had access to at this time in Istanbul in particular. Um, and from what I gather, he did this again in a couple of other places where the object of his pen was Islamic and he couldn't draw them, so he decided on his own that he would hire prostitutes and get them to dress up so he could draw them. Um, which, not great, but gave the women some extra money, and we have the pictures. The next slide represents us another type of traveler. Sidney Parkinson was a naturalist and an artist who accompanied Captain James Cook on his first voyage to the South Pacific. And on this voyage, he meticulously documented the people, the places, and the wildlife that he's, he experienced. Though he died before the voyage ended, his drawings and journal were saved, and once the ship was back in London, his brother published them. And this is just one sample. 
Um, they were so popular that nearly every account of Cook's voyages published copies of at least some of Parkinson's drawings. Um, this is one of the more uh, flamboyant ones, but they are just beautiful. He, he takes the position of a naturalist when he draws people as well as plants and animals. And so they are very detailed and as lifelike as he can possibly make them. So time is running short, and I promised pirates. So I'm going to talk about the two of the most famous and notorious female pirates in the golden age of sail, Anne Bonny and Mary Read. Anne Bonny was, by all accounts, a lively redhead Irish lass from County Cork. She was the daughter of a servant woman and a local attorney who was also her employer, William McCormick. Official records and contemporary letters dealing with her life are scarce, and most of our knowledge comes from uh, an account called A General History of Pirates, compiled by a fellow named Charles Johnson, and we have that in the collection. William McCormick, Bonnie's father, moved first to London to get away from his wife's family, who apparently gave him an allowance. Um, he began dressing his daughter as a boy and calling her Andy. But his wife found out and convinced her husband to, or convinced her family to cut off all of William's funds. So McCormick moved the family, uh, his mistress and Bonnie's mother and her, to the province of Carolina in the New World. <clears throat> he abandoned the Mick in front of Cormac so that they could blend more into the English citizenry of Charlestown. They had a rough start, but eventually he was able to finance a townhouse and eventually a plantation. Bonnie's mother died when she was 12. Her father tried to establish himself as attorney like he'd been in Ireland, but it wasn't particularly successful. So he joined a merchant business and accumulated a considerable fortune. Um, apparently Anne was discovered, was considered to be a good catch, but accounts say that she had a very fiery temper and possibly killed, well, it doesn't say she killed, she just stabbed a servant girl with a knife when she was 13 years old. In any event, she married a poor sailor and a small-time pirate named James Bonney, who hoped that uh, Anne would inherit her father's estate, but her father disowned them and kicked her out of the house. There is a story that she then set fire to her father's plantation, but there's no actual evidence to support that. However, it is known that sometime between 1714 and 1718, she and Bonnie moved to Nassau, a new Providence island, known as a sanctuary for English pirates called the Republic of Pirates. A lot of the pirates there received a king's pardon or otherwise evaded the law. However, it's also recorded that once they arrived in the summer of 1718, the governor, James Woods, or Woods Rogers, rather, um, convinced James Bonney to turn informant and to turn in the pirates so they could be arrested. And this did not please Anne in the slightest. She started hanging out in taverns where pirates frequented. And it was there that she met a fellow named Calico Jack Rackham, captain of the pirate ship Revenge. She left her husband and joined Rackham's crew. Rackham tried to buy her from Bonnie, um, but Bonnie wasn't selling, so they simply shipped out. <laughs> Mary Reed on the, uh, had a slightly different uh, start to life. Uh, she was legitimately born in 1685, also in England. Her mother had married a sailor and had a son. After her husband disappeared at sea, Mary's mother became pregnant from an affair. She attempted to hide the pregnancy by going to live with friends in the country, and shortly thereafter, her legitimate son died, and her mother got the brilliant idea to pretend that Mary was the previously born legitimate son because her husband's mother gave them a rather significant allowance. Well, apparently, uh, this disguise as a young boy convinced the grandmother and Mary and her mother continued to live off this money until Mary reached her teenage years. When dressed as a boy, she got a job as a footman and then employment on a ship. 
She later joined the uh, British military, not unlike Hannah Snell, and fought in the Nine Years' War in a battle where the uh, British went to the aid of their Dutch allies against the French. In male disguise, she proved herself in battle, but fell in love with a Flemish soldier. When they married, she used their military commission and gifts from intrigued brethren in arms to acquire an inn that they named the Three Horseshoes in the Netherlands. Her husband died an early death, and Mary Reed resumed male dress and military service at Holland, but with peace, there wasn't any room for advancement, so she quit and boarded a ship bound for the West Indies. Her ship was taken by pirates, whom, it's said, she willingly joined. In 1719, she accepted the king's pardon and took a commission as a privateer, which is a very sort of slim line between pirate and privateer. But then she joined the crew in mutiny. In 1720, she joined Calico Jack Rackham and Anne Bonny, who at the time believed her to be a man. And Bonnie eventually tweaked to the fact that Mary was a woman, and the two of them shared that secret, and only Calico Jack apparently knew. On 22nd August, 1720, the three of them stole an armed sloop named the William from the port at Nassau. Now, scholars are uncertain how female pirates like Reed and Bonnie concealed their sex in a male-dominated environment. Some of them, however, have theorized that wearing of breeches by female pirates may simply have either been a method of hiding their gender or simply practical clothing that solidified their working place on board ship among the other seamen. In October of 1720, Rackham and his crew were attacked by a king's ship, a sloop captain by a Jonathan Bennett, Barnett. Most of Rackham's pirates put up little resistance as many of them were too drunk to fight but not Mary and Anne. They apparently fought fiercely and managed to hold off Barnett's troops for a considerable time before they were captured. Rackham and his crew were taken to Jamaica where they were convicted and sentenced by the governor to be hanged. After they were sentenced, Reed and Bonnie both pleaded their bellies, um, asking for mercy because they were pregnant. And in accordance with English common law, both women received a temporary stay of execution until they gave birth. However, Mary Reed died in prison, most likely from fever accompanying her childbirth, and Anne stayed in prison until she gave birth and was later released. These two women were among the most notorious and violent pirates in the Atlantic. Governor uh, Woods Rogers even included Anne Bonney in a most wanted circular that was published in a Boston newspaper. One of my students, Claire Becker, is currently working on an online exhibit about these two. And we also hope to add m more exhibits about some of the other women I've talked about today and, and even more. So stay tuned for that. Here's a picture showing the two of them together. Um, I shall leave you today with what were purportedly Anne Bonnie's last words to her husband, Calico Jack Rackham, which um, given the adventurous and feisty women I've talked about today seem particularly um, appropriate. Quote, had you fought like a man, you need not have been hanged like a dog. <laughs> Thank you. We do have some time for questions, so if anyone has questions. Stephanie? Um, Wait, yeah. I'm wondering about what would happen if we went to the archives to look at some of these stuff. Uh, are yeah. there letters? It's, I don't, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. And she, why don't you repeat her question? <coughs> you want to try Hello? this other one? Does it work? If, if I come to the archives, uh, what will I find typewritten and what will I find handwritten? <laughs> I'm lazy. Um, <clears throat> did everyone hear that question? Um, okay, so the accounts, Lady Craven is published um, in print. 
Um, the accounts of Reed and Bonnie are in print. Hannah Schnell is in print, but in Dutch. Um, <clears throat> and um, the letters of Jemima Kindersley are also in print. Um, Salome uh, Dansforth's journal has never been published. Um, it is in manuscript, in her handwriting, and it's not one of these that's been copied over for, for neat after she got back. It's, it's actually the journal she clearly kept on board ship, along with a few letters. But it's in English, and her hand is very easy to read, so um, there's that. Um, I've read most of it. Um, a lot of the other materials we have in the collection are, are printed, though I did just purchase with help from the associates of the Bell Library, um, a manuscript journal of a German serving girl who went to Brazil to accompany her mistress who was marrying the king of Brazil. Um, and she writes in a very clear hand, I think this clearly was probably copied over, um, but it's, again, never been published. It's in German, but it's very clear German. Um, and it's from the turn of the uh, 19th century, so 18-something. Um, and it was a very short trip. She sailed out from Europe there. Um, they toured the country, and then he was kicked out and exiled back to Europe. Um, and she went both ways with her mistress. So um, there's no picture of her, but there are pictures and Wikipedia articles about um, the king and queen of, Peru, of uh, Brazil. Any other questions? Yes? Where do you get the items in your collection? Where do they come from? Um, we generally purchase the, oh, so the question was, where do we get the items in the collection? Where do they come from? Um, at the moment, we generally purchase them from rare book dealers. Um, we've been dealing with most of the same dealers since we opened in the 1950s, um, those that are still around. Um, we try to find dealers with good reputations who hire really good staff. Um, so a lot of the dealers we have hire PhDs um, in history, and so they have good research skills, so, the so they are able to um, authenticate and seek out materials, which saves us some time and money. They're people we trust. Um, occasionally, someone will donate something, but if they do, if um, you know, I have to spend a fair amount of time authenticating what it is, seeing if I can figure out where it came from, all of those things. So we really do prefer to purchase them as opposed to getting them as gifts. Um, in the early days of the library, the first curator, Jack Parker, used to travel to Europe go on buying trips and um, met with dealers there and um, saw the items that he wanted and then had them shipped home, um, wrote Mr. Bell long reports about them, and then the decision was made to purchase them or not. Um, even after Mr. Bell died, Jack continued to make trips for a while, but now with the internet and FedEx, um, everyone sends me, f you know, digital scans of the items, detailed descriptions, and then they ship it to me on spec. I examine it, decide if I want it, and purchase it from the comfort of my office. Um, which sometimes seems a shame and at other times doesn't seem such a bad thing. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all very much for coming out. So thank you everyone for coming out. If um, just a few last minute notes, um, we invite you to visit our Sherlock Holmes room, which is up on the second floor for viewing, um, which used to be over at Wilson Library. Um, we also have one exhibit open right now on the ground floor, which is also from the Bell Library, Festival, Spectacle, and Celebration in the Early Modern World on the ground floor in the Maxine Wallen Center Room 15. Um, as you can see right now, we are in process on our other exhibit, um, which will be the ABC of it, Why Children's Books Matter, which opens on February 11th. So we invite you to come back and view those three floors of materials from the CLRC celebrating the 70th anniversary of Dr. Irvin Curlin's first gift of children's book, books and artwork to the university libraries. And we also ask you to join us again on March 1st for a presentation from the University of Minnesota Archives. Thank you. And if you wanted a tour, Tim's in the back.